The conquered grave lives in me Lives in me, oh, it lives in me. Same power that conquered the grave lives in me, oh, it lives in me. Cause your love, your love, it rescued the earth. Lives in me, oh, lives in me. Same power that conquered the grave lives in me, oh, lives in me. Cause your love, your love. It rescue the earth lives in me, oh, it lives in me, cause you live in me, Lord, you live in me, hallelujah, the same power to conquer the grave, it lives in me, it lives in me, hallelujah, and blessed be your name, Jesus, I love the words of that song. Blessed be your name, your wonderful name. Thank you, Lord. It's kind of a resurrection service. So. I don't know what to do. It's kind of like this one, I don't know. We'll experiment. It's kind of a new song I've been playing with. sing so forgive me if I butcher it won't be the first time or the last y'all coming out on this beautiful beautiful day it's a sacrifice and sometimes we don't feel it but the reality is we got to sacrifice give God a, our time talent and treasure the three T's the reality is the world's hung up on 
sex, silver, and sloth, the three S's, that they can't give God their three T's, it hinders them. It hinders them. Sex, silver, and sloth. Laziness, spiritual laziness. It's the most dangerous. When King David was in Jerusalem and, and, and all was at rest and all was at peace and Joab was out at war, he went out, out onto his porch one day and he, he, it was midday and he, he slept in. He should have been at battle. He should have been with his soldiers. He should have been doing the work of God. But he got lazy, spiritually lazy. And he comes out onto his balcony one day and he, he looks out and there's a woman bathing herself. And that doesn't let Bathsheba off, Pastor Terry. She was a fault too. She, she sort of showed a little discretion. She laid a stumbling block in front of the psalmist, the sweet psalmist, the man of God, the anointed one. And one look turned into one touch. And one touch turned into a big mess. I challenge you for your three T's. Give your time, your time and your talent and your treasure to God. You'll never go wrong. Let's sing that one more time. We sing a man just in man just in Forever I am changed by your love In the beauty of your majesty We thank you, Lord Thank you, Jesus Thank you, Lord. Have your way tonight in this place Hallelujah, Jesus. God, carry over the anointing and the revival. We pray in the name of Jesus. What we experienced today at the boot camp, man, the great liberty, the great power and joy that we felt today, oh God, I pray. I pray that it would carry over. God, place joy within the people of God's hearts, Lord. God, I pray you fill this place. Bring revival to Reynoldsville, God. As we begin to flyer this place, oh God, I pray that you would touch people's hearts. Let them seek God in a deeper realm. Let them know God in a deeper realm. We want you, Lord. We long after you, oh God. In a dry and thirsty land, God, I pray for this nation. I pray you bring revival to this nation, God. We need help. God, this nation needs to repent, Lord God. Repent, Lord, for the kingdom of God is at hand. We pray. Thank you, Jesus. We're going to attempt to sing one last song. Well, maybe two songs, and then we'll turn Pastor. Take up. Take a quick uh, prayer request and then we'll turn it over. This is a Resurrection Day song. We don't call it Easter. That may turn some people off. You know what I'm talking about, Brother Walker. Yeah. Easter is after the pagan goddess Ashtoreth or Astarte. We don't like her. No. It's a fertility god. So I call it Resurrection Sunday because that's what it is. Actually, it was Resurrection Saturday. Long story. Don't have time to get into it. Yeah. Blood Wednesday, not Good Friday, but unfortunately I, I make enough waves out at the boot camp so I celebrate Good Friday service, unfortunately. I figure I'm not going to make any more waves. I'm good at that. One time an inmate come to me, he said, you're Paul. Mm -hmm. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah. Paul usually lasted about a year and a half everywhere he went and then they booted him out. Yeah, maybe I can make it longer than that. I'm at a year and a half right now, so. About two years in prison. Yeah, in prison. And he got the axe. Everywhere he went, he left, left a mark, though. God said to him, I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Paul preached the name of Jesus with boldness and confidence. Paul preached by the authority of the Holy Ghost. Paul preached with authority of Almighty God. Folks were converted. Folks were turned. Not all. This thing ain't for everyone. The Bible says not all, all men have faith. Not all men have faith. Not all men have faith. If 
Faith means I believe that Jesus died and rose again the, the, the third day. I wasn't there to see it. In reality, when Thomas came in and touched the nail prints in his hands and felt the wound in his side, he, he proclaimed that three and a half years he had spent with Jesus, but he cried out, My Lord and my God. After three and a half years, he finally understood the God that he was serving. He finally understood the deity of the God that went to a cross for us. He finally understood. Paul said, I preach Christ crucified. I preach Christ crucified. When he went into the Athenians, he, he found a, a, an image, a, a devotion. And it said, and it was in his scripted to the unknown God. Paul said to him, him I declare unto you. Him I declare unto you. For it is possible that the dead were resurrected. For it is possible that Christ died and rose again the third day and gave us life. And now He just doesn't give us life. He gives us life through His Spirit. And Jesus said to Thomas after He made the proclamation, He said, Blessed are they that haven't seen and yet believe. There's a greater, a greater blessing for us who haven't seen and yet believe in His wonderful name. Hallelujah, Jesus. I'll tell you what, we may got seven or eight people in here, but I feel the presence of God is crawling up right up my spine right now in the name of Jesus. I serve a God who's greater, who's greater than death, who defeated the power of death, who defeated Adam's sin and the curse. For the Bible says he became a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is every man that hangs on a tree. He became what I couldn't be. Hallelujah. He became lust. He became perversion. He became homosexuality. He became me and what I was so that I can be what I am thank you Jesus he became addiction he became pornography he became what I was this is an experimental song round two experiment this is a resurrection song. death 
Interesting or resurrected king has rendered you defeated. Forever he is glorified. Forever he is lifted high. Forever he is risen. He is alive.
somebody's heart unequivocally I've seen God move after years of prayers years of planting seeds and in reality is the Bible says Paul plants a pulse water but God has to give the increase right. God has to make that change God has to to open the hearts it's a three-step process correct plant water increase plant water increase so we'll pray about that we we have planted into a lot of people's lives and let's just pray a harvest comes pray for the boot camp a lot of people wanting to come here Trust me. Uh, they, they said, I'm going to drive up there. They don't care how long. So God's moving. Uh, we just need revival. We need revival. And, and God's moving in people's hearts. Curtis. Disciple. Disciple, yeah. Disciple is one of my right-hand men in, in the boot camp. Uh, he led my, uh, I think he did my theme of the week. Yeah. And uh, he assured me he'd be here. And, uh, I'm, I'm trying. Yeah. I think he struggled with some stuff. As soon as, you know, as soon as, the Bible says, as soon as the house is clean, swept, and garnished, the Bible says the unclean spirit says, look, I won't go back where I came from because I had it pretty darn good there. And so he grabbed seven other things that we never even dealt with in the first place. And the end state of that man's far worse than the beginning. <laughs> and, and we have to pray for people because normally, particularly when they leave the boot camp, and I'm not, I'm not speaking to him in general, I'm, so, I'm talking people in general, they get way late. They absolutely get way late. Hello. I mean, the devil just hits him. Big bad wolf. Huff, puff, blow our house down. Doors back to Egypt. For sure. And I'm preaching a three-part series in at the boot camp called Out of Egypt. The first part of that series was Out of Egypt because I called my son. It's one thing to get out of Egypt, okay? God gets us out of Egypt. He sets us on the timeout chair of life. He sets us on the thinking chair of life. He starts dealing with us. Once I get out of Egypt, there's always that allurement. There's Egyptians, I call them. There's folks, the Bible says in Numbers chapter 11, the mixed multitude that tried to allure the people of God back to where they came from. And then the third part of that series is Joshua chapter 5 verse 9. It says, this day I've rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. It's one thing to get out of Egypt. It's another thing to stay out of Egypt. Egypt I spent four years, four hard years in Egypt. And you learn Egypt and it's hard to get out. I mean, the reality is when you become a Christian, God deals with our characters all our lives. And he will continue to deal with that, that character. Character issues all our lives. Some things we cannot go back to. I, I can't go back to that. I can't go back to this. Uh, popping, snuff, sniffing, snorting, uh, huffing, puffing, smoking, token, lying, cheating. I can't go back to that life. And, I, and the allurement for always to go back to that life is there. And it's deep stuff. I don't even have time to elaborate on it. The four R's of Christianity. Repentance. Respond, repent, restoration and repositioning, the four R's. We've got to constantly go through that process to survive our Christian walk. So we'll pray for your friend, we'll pray for your disciple, we'll pray for your grandfather, right? Yes. Anyone else? Uh, we had an inmate, uh, the one whose white blood cell count, that was crazy, man. Did I tell you about that? Crazy, freaked the doctors out. White blood cell count went back. Did you know about that? Okay, his white blood cells were way off. I don't know if they thought cancer. I don't know what they thought. They sent it out to be tested. We laid hands on him in the name of Jesus, and Jesus healed him yeah. unequivocally. The next time he come up to my office, hey man, freak the doctors out. The white blood cells are back to normal. They can't explain it. 
Love to freak them doctors out. That's right. It's an amazing thing. Love to just mess their world up, right? They spend a whole lot of time practicing on you. <laughs> practice. It's called a practice, right? <laughs> they haven't perfected it, right? And the morgues are filled with people they're practicing on. <laughs> Hopefully not me someday. <laughs> Let's all stand. Let's give God the glory and praise and honor in Jesus Christ. A special night tonight. We've got a special night. We've got, we got, I think, a testimony. And uh, Pastor Terry always brings us, delivers us a great word. I, pr I appreciate, I, I believe God's proud. Proud of the people that stepped out on this gorgeous 75 degree day. Hard to do. But you did it. And I'm proud of that. Huh? Thanks, dear. Um, precious Father, we thank you tonight. We thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do. I ask you to touch Jamie's friend, Brother Jamie's friend. I ask you to move in his life. Work, Lord. We pray by the power of the Holy Ghost. Extend in their hearts. Extend your hand to their heart. Your great love. Your power. Your anointing. We pray in the name of Jesus. Move on our hearts, Lord. Give them, give them the right timing to say it and what to say, oh God. According to your word, touch his heart. Hansel, those that aren't here tonight, my mom, uh, my brother Trace who keeps trying to come out and we know that something's trying to fight. God, I pray you work in that matter, Lord. Curtis, Brother Curtis's request, Lord, I appreciate his faithfulness. God, I pray you move in his heart and his life. We know all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. God, we pray for his grandfather, for healing virtues in his grandfather. We pray for the boot camp, Lord. I pray protection out there for Pastor Terry and myself. God, I pray we need your strength, Lord. Forgive any of iniquities. If there's anything that reaches in my heart, that re let it reach the throne of heaven for your mercy, God. Things in my heart. Lord, I confess sin before you right now. We confess that we're inferior people. We cannot make it in this life without you, Lord. I need you. I need a Savior. I need your help, oh God. Lord, I ask you to forgive my sin. Be faithful to forgive my sin. Forgive my iniquity. We're, we're, there's none that doeth good. They're all have fallen short of the glory of God. Each and every one of us, Lord. And, and we confess, Lord. Help us to own, not only confess, but to confess and forsake, oh God. We thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Please hear us, Lord. Please hear us. In Jesus' name. Let's say the Lord's Prayer. Sister Hannah, would you lead us in the Lord's Prayer? Our Father, who art in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses. Forgive us our trespasses. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. Glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to turn the service over to Pastor Terry, however he wants to handle it. At the end, we're going to handle communion. It's a very special night. Amen, amen, amen. amen. Uh, I believe we're going to hold off on the testimony until a later date. Yes or no? It's up to you. It's up to you. Yeah, we can wait. Okay, we will wait. Um, but Carrie, Sister Carrie's got some, some powerful words for us and look forward to hearing that um, God has moved in a tremendous way in her life brought her from some pretty bad situations and strengthened her as a result of it and I believe her words would uh, strengthen those of us that, have, that also struggle with things and uh, have been in situations that weren't necessarily ideal for us um, so look forward to that um, in, the, in the coming weeks I want to I want to preach a little message tonight. But first, I want to talk about something that's going to be occurring this weekend, or rather this week coming up Tuesday night. Anybody know what's going to happen in our skies Tuesday night? I know Jamie does. Pam Payne probably does because I know Jamie's probably told her a hundred times. Blood moon. Uh, yes, the blood moons. Um, we got something phenomenal coming up. Uh, a series of blood moons coming uh, in the next year and a half. Wow. That. These things are very, very significant. It's not prophesied in the Bible anywhere that there would be four blood moons and an event would happen. Yet, God, in His sovereignty, let us know way back in Genesis that He would use signs in the heavens right. as a sign to show us things to come and things that should come to pass. He said, let there be lights in the firmament of heaven and divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. And God specifically said, let them be for signs. So what's a blood moon? Does our moon literally turn into blood? No, it doesn't. 
what happens is the Earth gets in between the sun and the moon, and it causes an eclipse. The light then is blocked from the moon, so it can't reflect the light as it normally does, but what it does is the sun's light rays kind of bounce around and curve around the Earth to the point where it actually gives a little bit of light on the moon, and it turns it to a reddish orangish color, similar to blood. We got one coming up, uh, the significance of these things. Now these things occur a lot. They've occurred a lot of times, usually about twice a year they occur. Very rarely do we have four in a year and a half period, but now, something that's even more rare, uh, has only happened three times since 1492. That's a long time. Uh, and I believe it's only happened ten times since 1 AD. So this is something that's extremely rare. You think of how often a moon comes up every night, right? Right. That, so this will be the fourth time in his, since 1 AD, fourth rather, fourth time since 1492, I'm going to give you a lot of dates, it's alright, that it's happened on Jewish feast days. There's something significant about it happening on feast days. It's going to be, of course, Passover is coming up on Tuesday. we got the Jewish Passover. Uh, and then we got the Feast of Tabernacles coming up uh, October 8th. And then next April 4th, we have the Passover again. And then uh, September 28th of 2015, we have the Feast of Tabernacles. The significance of these moons occurring on feast days is this, 1492. 1492 was a bad year for the Jews. Uh, it was during the Spanish Inquisition, and if we look back in history, uh, I don't know if our history books will tell us this, uh, the full scope of the, the ordeal or not, because uh, we know how uh, angled and, and twisted some of our history books are, uh, but we find in 1492, King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella of Spain gave the Jews a four-month ultimatum to convert to Catholicism or leave the nation. Whoa. Spanish Inquisition. Uh, so the Jews that didn't want to convert to Catholicism, that really wanted to... <laughs> wanted to go with what God had always instructed them and, and to be who the people that they were called to be, decided that, you know what, we're going to go ahead and go. We're going to go ahead and get out of Spain. And so the ones that didn't want to convert were left to go. The ones that said, okay, we'll convert, were converted under torture and converted under duress and converted uh, under tremendous pressure. And then to test that conversion, to make sure it was authentic, they were tortured. Uh, they were, I don't know what kind of torture systems they had back then, I'm sure none of them were pleasant. And then to find out, they, well, maybe their conversion wasn't necessarily authentic, and so they were burned at the stake anyway. And so it, it was a tremendous time of persecution for the Jews uh, by the lovely Catholic Church. And we're not going to beat up on people, but we're going to beat up on a church. Uh, there's a reason God in Revelation 18 says, come out of her, my people. There's a reason uh, he has right. called his people to come out yes, of this abomination, this harlot, this great whore that we read about in Revelation. And so we have in 1492, right around the time, the, the 1493, 1494 was the feast days that this, these blood moons occurred in. 1492 was the Inquisition. Uh, 1492 also strikes a chord to us, right? In 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Yeah. We remember that from school. And... There's a lot of historians that are coming out now saying that Columbus was perhaps a closet Jew, a very devout religious Jew, who was at that time try, not trying to find America to bring riches and gold to Spain, rather trying to find a refuge for the Jews that were uh, for the coming persecution and for trying to find them a safe land. Uh, it's, it's also uh, noted that he um, was not funded by Queen Isabella, but rather by two Jews that who converted to Catholicism to avoid death. So. They had converted, but they were funded and saying, hey, hey, Columbus, go find us a place to go because this isn't a real conversion. We need to get out of this place. We need our people to get out and find a place of refuge. Uh, their names, Louis de Santi Centangel and Gabriel Sanchez. <laughs> Forgive me for my Spanish. Um, they had given them uh, 17,000 ducats or ducats, which actually is equivalent of, what did I see today? 1.3 million? Might have been even more than that, dollars equivalent. They gave him a whole lot of money to go find somewhere for them to go. And so Columbus, it's revealed that he was pretty much a really, a really devout kind of Jew, uh, and he was set out trying to find a place of refuge. Isn't it any surprise today that we actually have a higher Jewish population in our nation than Israel does? Perhaps, perhaps that was the refuge that they were seeking. Perhaps Possibly. that was the, 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 the place. Um, Migration. The next time we see the Tetrad, which is the four blood moons occurring on the feast days, was 1948, or rather 1949, 1950. Wow. This happened on the feast. We, remember, we know, those of us that have any kind of understanding of biblical prophecy understand what happened in 1948. Israel became a state. Israel was recognized as a nation. God uh, declaring, or fulfilling rather, Ezekiel 38, 
declaring that I will bring my people back into their lands, right. though they were scattered, yes. though they had been scattered abroad, mostly because of their disobedience, not because I didn't love them, but because I had to punish them and bring them back into subjection to me, where they would ultimately serve me and ultimately come to a fullness of understanding of me, that they had to be, they were separated, they were brought back into Israel, and that was, uh, of course, the day, uh, May 14th, 1948, the modern state of Israel was born. One more. 1967, 1968, the Tetrad, whereas the city of Jerusalem was reunited during this time. These four blood moons singled something that, uh, remember, we, uh, Israel was fighting Jordan, right, over some land. There was a, a six-day war, the Bible, it was called a six-day war, and so they were able to reattain their original land. They got back what was taken from them, uh, West Jerusalem. Wow. Um, Jerusalem was undivided and under Jewish control for the first time since the destruction of Jerusalem by Rome in 70 AD. That's significant. That's pretty powerful. See, all of these things, these, these first three tetrads, or these three tetrads since 19, or 1492, have always signaled some, a major shift in the history of the Jews. Wow. A major shift of uh, history of the world, actually. Uh, and so we got one coming up starting Tuesday night. Now, I'm excited for this because there's a couple prophecies that and I'm not going to spend too much more time on this, but there's a couple prophecies, pretty large things that are going to affect the Jews, but also us uh, globally. It's going to, this, this thing isn't just going to affect the Jews, but there's two major prophecies that have yet to be fulfilled that I could think perhaps if God, if his track record sticks by what he's always been on, then I, something's going to happen. The two prophecies are... <laughs> Amen. The two prophecies. One, perhaps World War III, the Sixth Trumpet War. You'll read about it in Revelation 9, talking about the Sixth Trumpet War. The, it was, the angel was loosed from the river Euphrates, and he was sent out, and a third of mankind was killed. It's about 2.2 billion people right now. Uh, so we're going to see this thing happen, and perhaps this is the triggering event that's going to happen during these four blood moons. That's a whole lot of people. Uh, and, and, and you think about, well, how are you going to kill 2.2? How are you going to kill a third of mankind's population on this earth? You're not going to do it with ground infantry. You're not going to do it with a ground war. It's going to be, uh, it's going to be nuclear weapons, atomic weapons, uh, some of the space weapons that DARPA and NASA has up there that, that a whole lot of folks maybe don't know about. Uh, but you're going to be seeing some major, major weaponry, some high-tech high gear coming down here to destroy a third of mankind. And it begins in the river Euphrates. The Bible says that it emanated from the river Euphrates. Euphrates River runs through Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Iraq. Right. And so we see great turmoil and great problems, and it's always chaos over there. And that's where this thing's going to originate. Perhaps this war starts in the next year and a half. Something else that is majorly significant to the Jews and also the world is the peace treaty. Uh, Daniel 9.27 says that he, meaning the Antichrist, shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of that week, he will cause the oblation to cease right. and make desolate the temple. And so we see uh, this one week. Well, it's not really a literal week as in seven days, but it's a seven-year period, right? right? Daniel 70 weeks, we go back. The first 69 weeks have already passed. And it's been a long space of time since the Messiah was cut off, which was the end of the 69th week until we start the last week of human, exist human government on this earth, which is the 70th week prophecy of Daniel. Right. And so we have in the midst of that week, right, the three and a half year period, the abomination of desolation, we so read Daniel, let him understand, Jesus said in Matthew 24, um, that he's going to stand up in the temple, declare himself to be God, right. cause the oblation to cease. What's an oblation, Terry? It is the animal sacrifice. The Jews are going to reinstitute the animal sacrifice, just like they did daily in the temple. They're going to bring that back. And you can imagine the uproar from PETA and all these other animal rights yeah. groups and, uh, and just the crazy stuff that's going to be going on. So those are two possibilities that we could see happen in the next year and a half. It's crazy. Man. That peace treaty signed, and if it has the components that's necessary for it to fulfill the 927 uh, right. prophecy, if we see that it's come through a global community, if it's come through a global community, if it's for a specific time frame, if it's for a seven year period, because certain uh, aspects of the peace treaty couldn't, they couldn't settle everything, but they're really like, hey, let's just do this for seven years, and seven years we'll revisit this thing. And come back. And also the sharing arrangement of the Temple Mount. The Jews will be able to build the third temple on the Temple Mount. It won't, uh, won't interfere with the Dome of the Rock and the al Mosque that the uh, Muslims are using right now. So it will be a sharing arrangement of the Temple. Those things have to be in this peace treaty for this to be the peace treaty of 927. That triggers the final seven years of life as we know it on this earth. So very, very fascinating and, and, and powerful times ahead. And very exciting. To me it's exciting. 
I don't. I wouldn't want to live in any other time than now. I, I believe that we're here, each and every one of us, for such a time as this. Yes. The Bible says uh, in eleven thirty-two, Daniel. Maybe I just preached on Daniel tonight. I don't know. Daniel eleven thirty-two that. They that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And so we, the, and, and he who understands among few, shall instruct many. And those of us that have the understanding of this end time prophecy and are really, really geared to really see this revival. I, I'm, I'm tempted when this peace treaty signed, and I know it's the one to just quit my job and just, uh, I haven't talked to my wife about this, we might have to talk about this, but just quit the job, right? Because then we really have three and a half years until hell really un, un, um breaks out between before hell really is unleashed and, and we don't have time to be just going about life like it says in the days of Noah where people are given in marriage and people are just going on thinking nothing's going to happen we don't have time we got to get the word out we got to get the warning out the watchmen need to sound their trumpets and sound their alarms and so there's exciting times ahead perilous times right it's going to be it's not going to be easy for the Christian man and woman. It's not going to be Correct. easy for the young Christians. It's not going to be easy to see our babies perhaps starving to death because we didn't take the market. We can't find food. We can't go buy food. We can't buy housing. And we can't buy medicine. And we can't buy shelter. We can't buy anything because we don't have this market. So there's perilous times. And that's something I'm going to get into here in the coming weeks. Maybe do, a, do an end time teaching maybe uh, one of the services. But because uh, it's fascinating things. But, but there's fascinating times. Tuesday night. I don't know in our region, in our uh, hemisphere, how well we'll see it, if we'll see it, what time it's going to occur. Uh, but just be looking out your windows, all I can tell you. Hopefully it's an, a clear night. We don't have uh, an overcast sky. Hopefully it's nice and clear and we get to see this beauty uh, as perhaps a, a beginning signal of things to come, uh, of, of an end to come. And, and uh, it's, it's going to be tough, but I'm, I'm, I'm so glad, right? That he has told us that, to, that the present suffering does not compare to the glory that should be revealed. Reveal. Right, come on. And so that glory, it's, it's worth going Jesus. through this stuff to know where it will be. And that we won't have to worry about trouble anymore. So Blood Moon Tuesday night, that's the first one. And then uh, we'll revisit that. Uh, we'll remind you back uh, coming up in October. What did I say? I think it was October 8th. But I want to talk a little bit tonight, uh, kind of a... Thing that I used to talk about, the, I talk about the boot camp quite often, is looking into trying to get life out of dead things. Trying to, you know, he, he was resurrected, right? He, he didn't stay dead. And so we need to not be focusing and looking for revival and resurrection from dead things in life. My message for you tonight is why seek ye the living among the dead? We read in Matt, uh, Luke 24, if you want to turn to Luke 24, if you've got your Bibles tonight. Luke 24, the first 12 verses. Now upon the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they came unto the sepulcher, bringing the spices which they had prepared, and certain others with them. And they found the stone rolled away from the sepulcher. And they entered in and found not the body of Lord Jesus. And it came to pass, as they were much perplexed thereabout, behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And as they were afraid and bowed down their faces to the earth, they said unto them, Why seek ye the living among the dead? He is not here. He is risen. Remember how he had spake unto you when he was yet in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered in the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. And they returned from the sepulcher and told all these things unto the eleven and to the rest. It was Mary Magdalene and Joanna and Mary the mother of James and other women who were with them, which told these things unto the apostles. And their words seemed to them as idle tales, and they believed them not. Then arose Peter and ran unto the sepulcher and stooping down, stooping down, he beheld the linen clothes laid by themselves and departed, wondering in himself at that which was come to pass. Wow. I love the story of the cross. I love the willingness of, his life, of, of Jesus to lay his life down for us. I don't see a man kicking and screaming against the, the nails. I don't see a man saying, no, 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 I, I can't do this. I, let someone else do this. But he, he willingly took the cross. He, he willingly shed his blood. He willingly took the mocking and the scorning. Right. And the blasphemous words and the hatred and the mocking and the spitting and everything. He took it. He took it. He took it all. He took it all willingly. And they didn't have to break his legs, fulfilling the prophecy that there shall be no bones broken. You know, when you're hanging on the cross, it's not a death of blood, it's not a death of starvation, it's a death of asphyxiation where the weight of your body, 
of your on your lungs causes you to almost suffocate when you're not able to breathe. Wow. And so what they did was when their their leg that your legs could only withstand it for so long, and your legs are holding you up, trying to bring the weight of your body up so it's off your chest. Yeah. And so what they would have to do routinely, because the men would fight the death and fight to breathe, is they would come along and take a rope, probably a big heavy iron spear, and break their legs so that they could no longer hold themselves up, and then they would suffocate to death. That was the death. That was the agonizing part of the death. It was a shameful. Jesus said he despised the shame of the cross, but right. for the joy that was set before right. him. It was the joy of Terry. It was the joy of Lee and Teresa. The joy of Curtis and Jamie and, and Carrie and Champagne and Hannah. It was for the joy set before him that he endured right. the agony and the shame of the cross. But when they came to Jesus, they broke the thieves and the robbers. They broke their legs so that they would finally give up the ghost of Bible and die. Right? They give up their life. They would no longer fight and they would just have to succumb to the death on the cross. When they came came to Jesus. He was already dead. He, he wasn't fighting this thing for us. He, he wasn't resisting it for us. He, he willingly took his, laid down his life. The Bible says, he said uh, to, I believe it was to Pilate, no man takes my life. I, I lay it down. No one, no one has the authority to take my life. I laid it down for you and, and I willingly give up my life for the ones that I love. And so they came to Jesus and no bones needed to be broken because he had submitted to what he was called to do. He had submitted to our need. When it was us that should have been up there suffering. When it was us that should have been up there asphyxiated. When it was up, us that should have been up there bleeding. When it was us that should have been up there with, with all that shame and guilt. The concentration of the sin upon his shoulders. It should have been us. But he said, no man takes my life. I lay it down. Right. Mary's reaction in John 20, 15. Mary's reaction, she says, where have you taken him? Where is he? I'll, I'll go get him and I'll, I'll put him back where he belongs. See, she thought, she said, who has taken him? Who has taken him from the place where he ought to be? She thought maybe that was where he is resting place and where he should finally be. She didn't get maybe the full revelation of what he had come to do. But she said, you know what? I'm going to go get him and put him back where he belongs. And I think as a church, that's what we need to do is maybe not, certainly not keep him in the ground, but at least put him back where he belongs at the center. Put him back at, where he belongs at the forefront. Put him back uh, so he's no longer just a peripheral mention in the church but he, he is the church he is yes. the heart he is the center he is the very right. centrifugal uh, figure in the church right. and so she Please. says let me go find him and tell me where you took him I'm going to put him back where he belongs and I think we need to put him back where he belongs in each and every one of our lives see he's no longer on the cross he, he got off the cross and so that cross is now for us to hang on that cross is now our place to be that cross is now where we need to be putting ourselves daily Paul that I crucify myself daily. And so the cross is now open and free for us to put ourselves on there to allow our flesh to die, to allow the, our carnal desires to die, to allow the things that we think we ought to be doing to die and the things that we ought to be living to die so that we can also be resurrected as he was. Right. Thank you. Some churches, he's still on the cross. Right. My, my Bible says he got off. Right. So I'm not going to put them on there anymore. So we find here, in, in, Mary, in John 20, 15, around 20, 15, we see Mary stoops down into the sepulcher to look for him. And we read, uh, just read in, in Luke 24 that Peter stooped down to try to find him. They were stooping down into a sepulcher. They were stooping down trying to find a big thing in a small place. They were stooping down trying to find something that was supposed to be alive. And that was something that was alive in a dead place. They were looking for life in a dead place. Right. Yeah. They were looking for something for fulfillment in a dead place. They were looking for something of satisfaction in right. a dead place. They were looking for something to fulfill their need and their hole that was just left and just created because he had left them, they thought. And they were looking to fill that hole up with dead things. Right. They stooped down. They lowered themselves down to a level where they were looking for something big in a very little place. Many times in our lives, and as we walk this walk, especially before we were saved, but even during times of, uh, of living saved, we still try to have that. We still have that tendency to look for living things among the dead. Right. 
Wow. We still have a tendency to try to fulfill things in our, in our flesh, try to fulfill needs that we, have to, that we feel we have to fulfill, but we're looking in all the wrong places. We're, we're looking in all the wrong things. We're going after all the wrong stuff because if we really wanted satisfaction, if we really wanted joy, if we really wanted a complete wholeness within ourselves, we would look to Him instead of the dead things. We would look to Him. We would raise ourselves up and go after Him rather than stooping down into some old dead things. They were looking for something in the wrong place. They were looking for something big in a very dead place. Why is it we spend so much time in our lives looking for life in dead things? Proverbs 8.35 For whosoever findeth me findeth life and shall obtain favor. Psalm 36.9 For with thee is the fountain of life. Psalm 1611, Thou will show unto me the path of life. In thy presence is fullness of joy. And at thy right hand there are pleasures forevermore. See, there's fulfillment in Jesus that you can't get in the things in this life. There's satisfaction that you can't find at the end of a needle. There's pleasures that you can't find on the, under the sheets on a bed. There is only found satisfaction and true fulfillment and true joy found in the presence of Jesus. Right. But so often we get so distracted and think that he can't fully meet our needs. That maybe perhaps he can't satisfy these certain things in ourselves. And so we go crawling back. We go, as the pig goes, miring the clay. It goes, it was back into the mud, right? It just got washed off. And then it goes waddling right back into the mud. Adult returning to its vomit. We go back to these old dead, adamic things that are going to do nothing in our lives but bring more destruction and more unhappiness and more uh, unrighteousness and more disgruntled and more frustration and more unhappiness and more... Uh, just anger and frustration because we're not getting the satisfaction from the things in life because we're not looking in the right place. Thank you, Jesus. And so they were stooping down, looking for Jesus. That's powerful. In a place that he was not destined to stay. Right. They, were, they were looking for something in a place that he had told them previously, don't go looking for a dead body. It's not going to be there. Don't. I'm going to be resurrected. I'm going to be ascended. I'm coming back. Don't you think I'm? Don't think I'm going to leave you where you are. I'm, I'm coming back to be with you. This isn't the end of the story. And so follow my example. Don't go after the dead things over and over again. Once, once I resurrect something, once I bring it back to life, you don't need to be looking in the tombs anymore. You don't need to be looking in the sepulchers anymore. Don't you go back to those old dead things anymore because there's no life in there. There, was no, there wasn't even a body. There wasn't even a bone. Just a, some old rags that they had wrapped them up in. There was no life in that place. And yet they were looking for life in a dead place. Powerful. Jeremiah 21. We're going to go through the Bible. Well, you can go Genesis and Revelation. I don't have to work tomorrow. So tomorrow night, so we've got plenty of time. It's Jeremiah what, bro? 21. Jeremiah 21. We're going to bounce around Jeremiah. Then we're going to go to Isaiah. Then we're going to go back to Jeremiah. Uh, the word is good. The word is good. Jeremiah 21. 5. And I myself will fight against you with an outstretched hand and a strong arm, even in anger and in fury and in great wrath. Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. See, he was speaking to Jerusalem. He was speaking to his people. He said, I'm going to be against you. I am going to come against you and smite you with a strong arm, even in my anger, even in my fury, and even in my great wrath. I myself will fight against you. Why was he fighting against the, these people? Why was he fighting against those that he loves? Because the Bible says that he chastens those that he loves. And we read further on that he used Babylon to come against Israel and that they burned it with fire. So you need, sometimes God will use your enemies to come against you to bring you back into the place where you need to be. Sometimes God will use the very people that you can't stand, the very people that you know are after you in, in, to bring you into a place of subjection. He says, Behold, I set before you in verse 8, Thus saith the Lord, I set before you the way of life and the way of death. I've, I've revealed it to you. It's a very clear path. One way or the other. One leads to life. One leads to death. Which path are you going to go on? Which path are you going to follow? Are you going to go after the dead things and go after all the things that I brought you from? Are you going to continue to go back to the old things of your old nature? Or are you willing? 
Are you willing to follow the path of life? Are you willing to follow the path of life where there is pleasures forevermore? Where the, the path, of the life, path of life is the presence of fullness of joy. Where uh, for with thee, Lord, for with you, Lord, is the fullness of joy and the faith and the fountain of life. There's two paths that we are called to walk, that we can walk. One is the life, one is of death. Narrow, straight is the way, and narrow is the gate, and few there are that enter in. But broad is the way, and wide is the gate that leadeth to destruction, and many be there that find it. The everlasting covenant. The everlasting covenant. How do we find fullness of joy in unseen things? When we have been so programmed by society, by culture, by perhaps just history of our family, to only be able to understand and receive pleasure and fulfillment from seeing things, from natural things, from things in our own realm in which we right. see. How is it that we find fulfillment in the unseen things? How is it that we find fulfillment in a Jesus that we've never touched, that we've never encountered, that we've never necessarily walked in, his, in, in a physical presence, actually have seen him and sat down along the brook and talked to him? How is it that we get that fulfillment from the unseen things? Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55. Everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come and buy and eat. Yea, come, buy wine and milk without money and without price. In other words, you don't have to buy this. I got it for free. I got it available for you. You don't have to come with me. You don't have to go out and try to work just to get something from me. But you can come into my presence. I've got something for you. I've got something that's going to satisfy that hunger. And no, no, don't worry. I can take care of that thirst too. Don't, don't you worry. Don't you get caught up in this life and think that there's no thing, nothing that's going to come from me that's going to satisfy you. I assure you, everything that comes from me is going to satisfy you. Because without me, there is no satisfaction. Thank you, Jesus. Wherefore, or why, do you spend money for that which is not bread? And you labor for that which satisfies not. Hearken diligently unto me, and eat ye that which is good. And let your soul delight itself in fatness. See, God wants us to be obese in his satisfaction. He wants us to be overweight in his joy. He, he doesn't want us to be um, some skinny, scantily clad little person trying to sustain ourselves off the things in this world because the things in this world are going to bring no fatness to our soul. They're going to bring no satisfaction to our being. They're going to bring no joy to our homes. And he's saying, what? Why are you spending money? Why are you using the resources that I've given you and spending it on things that are going to bring you nothing? Why are you wasting your time going after the things that are not good? Why are you spending money on something that is not bread that will bring no kind of satisfaction to you? Incline your ear and come unto me. Hear and your soul shall live. And I will make an everlasting covenant with you, even the sure mercies of David. Oh, yes. This is how we find that satisfaction in the unseen things. Incline our ear. We listen. We listen to the Word of God. We listen to the Word of God to actually speak to us. Not, not just the letters on the page, not just uh, the chapters in the book, but also His voice. The voice of God leading us through this life. That's where satisfaction, from hearing my daddy, from having a conversation with God, that's my satisfaction. That's how I receive satisfaction in the unseen things. For I can't see him, but I know that he walks with me. I, I can't see him, but I know that he talks with me. I, I can't see him, but I know he goes before me and makes all those crooked ways straight. I know that he goes before me and makes bridges over water. And then he makes uh, the, the places that I need to go. He prepares the way for me. He prepares a place for me. That is the everlasting covenant. Seek ye, verse 6, Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is yet near. near. Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him. And to our God, he will abundantly pardon. Right. Not just somewhat pardon. Not just the things you did on a Tuesday in the odd years. 
And then sometimes on the weekends. But he's going to abundantly pardon. It's everything. He abundantly pardons. Thank you. But how do we get that pardon? How, what is the process that we must go through to get that kind of pardon? We must forsake our ways, our wicked ways. Yes. And let the unrighteous man forsake his thoughts. And let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him. I'm so glad that the times that I've offended God and the times that I've been unfaithful to Him, I'm so thankful that He's been faithful to me. That His faithfulness never stopped when mine did. I'm, I'm so glad that He's always been with me, though I was always so often trying to be far from Him. And I'm so glad that He has stuck by me as a friend, even when I was His enemy. I'm so, oh God, I'm so thankful that He's stuck next to me. When I was so undeserving, Let's go to Jeremiah 2, and this is something I've spoken of at the boot camp. It's a fascinating story to me. Chapter 30. I don't even know what I said. I'm sorry. Jeremiah 2. Jeremiah 2. See, oftentimes, we've played the harlot in our walk with God. Israel played the harlot for, <laughs> for their whole existence. And many probably still are. We've played a harlot. What's a harlot? It's a harlot someone that's unfaithful. Right? We've committed adultery in our relationship with God. And we've gone after other things. We've gone after other things and, and elevated other things above God. And so what we've done basically is we've gone to whoring. And that's strong, but that's biblical. That, that's in here too. That's in the Bible too. He says, my people have gone a whoring. We've, we, they've gone after strange things. They've gone after everything that I told them not to. Even when I told them to come unto me, they've gone out and they've served Baal. And they've gone out and they were men of Belial. And they've gone out and they did all these things with the other pagans and all the heathens. And they've accepted their gods and started worshiping their gods. And they forgot me. Jeremiah 2, verse 11. Hath the nation changed their gods, which are not yet gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be astonished, O ye heavens, and be horribly afraid. Yes, be very desolate, saith the Lord. He's, he's saying to the angels in heaven, be astonished at this. How have they done this? How can they forsake me when I brought them out of Egypt, when I brought them out of their bondage, when I brought them out of their slavery, when I brought them and snatched them out of a lifestyle that was going to lead to death and destruction? How can they go back once again to the same thing? Yes. How can they go back and change the glory that I gave them and take it for a glory that does not profit them? Be astonished, O ye heavens. Be amazed at this. Be terribly afraid. Be horribly afraid, he says. Be very desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. This may not seem like a resurrection message right now, but don't worry, we're going to get there. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters. Oh, we remember that from the psalm, don't we? And we hewed out, and they hewed out them, cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. So once when I had, they had cisterns that could hold water, they could hold my spirit, they, right? They could hold my fellowship and my love. And now what they have done, they've forsaken those kind of cisterns, and now they're going after these cisterns to try to fill things that can't hold water. They're trying to fill their hearts up and their lives up with things that have no ability to hold anything good. Verse 18, And now what hast thou done to do in the way of Egypt to drink the waters of Sihor? Or what hast thou do to do in the way of Assyria to drink the waters of the river? Thine own wickedness shall correct thee, and thy backsliding shall reprove thee. Know therefore, and see it is an evil thing and bitter, that thou hast forsaken the Lord thy God, and that my fear is not in thee, saith the Lord of hosts. They've, he said to his people, what place do you have going back to Egypt and drinking their waters? When I have given you waters of living life, I, I have given you a fountain of life, I have given you waters that if you drink, Jesus said it, the woman at the well, and if you drink the water from this right. well, you will once again thirst. It's, not, it's going to be a temporary fix for an eternal problem. There's going to be a thirst inside of you that you're not going to get satisfaction from this well. He said, but to that woman, but if you drink of the waters that I have, if, if you get a taste of the waters that I have, if you get some living waters flowing out of your belly, if you drink of the fountain of living, of living water and the fountain of life, 
There is a satisfaction that's going to come to you that can't be matched, mirrored, or imitated in this world. It can't be duplicated, and it can't be imitated. There's only one source of water in which we can drink from, and which we can have a, a fellowship with, and in which we can have a full satisfaction with, and it is not the rivers of the Nile. It's not the rivers of bondage. It's not the rivers of Sihor. It's right. not the rivers of our past, and it's not the rivers of the things that God has pulled us from, but rather it is the living, the living water that it comes from a fellowship with Him. And that comes from walking beside Him. The Bible says that by, He leads me by the still waters and the green pastures. He makes a place for me to lay, anoints my head with oil, He makes my cup to flow over, and surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life, and I will find a stable place in the house of God. I, I want to find my place at Bethel. I, I want my refuge and my abode to be in Bethel. Bethel is the house of God, and that's where I want to be. And that's the only place I'm going to find something that I can drink that's going to fully satisfy this crazy even this need that I have in my life. And so many times we look to other things to fulfill a hole that God has purposed to place inside of us that only He can fulfill. He, he puts that emptiness inside of us that we would chase after Him, that we would hunger after Him, that we would thirst after Him. He, he puts something down on the inside of us that we would apprehend Him, that we would pursue Him and try to overtake Him and, and bring Him in. Even sometimes what God does is that He reveals Himself to us first, right? The Bible says that we have not chosen Him, but He has chosen us. And so He reveals Himself to us shows himself in a magnetic way, right? In a, in a manifested way, in whatever way each of us have encountered God. He shows himself and then he turns around and walks away and says, all right, now you come after me. Paul said, I, I, I would that I would apprehend that which I am apprehended of Christ Jesus. And so Paul said, he first apprehended me. He took the reins of my heart. He captivated my heart. He, he took my affections and he, he made himself known to me and I fell in love with him. And then I, now it's my responsibility to apprehend what I'm apprehended of. Wow. I was first apprehended. And now i got to apprehend him. i got to go after him and put my arms around him and say, no, you need to stay with me. I can't yes. do this on my own. Oh, I, yes. I can't be without you, Lord. Right. I need you in my life. And so I'm going to hold on to you with dear life, knowing that there are things trying to pull me back, nipping in my heels. And if I hold on to you, they're not going to pull me back. But if I let go just a little bit, they're going to pull the rug out from underneath me and they're going to drag me back to the places that you set me free from. Right. For of old time, verse 20, I have broken thy yoke and burst thy bands, and thou saidest, I will not transgress when upon every high hill and upon every green tree thou wanderest play in the harlot. He said, yes. Yes, I have put a yoke upon you. I have put restrictions on you. I have put a boundary on you and set parameters for you to live in your life. And I don't do this because I'm legalistic. I don't do this because I'm strict. And I don't do this for my own entertainment and pleasure. I put yokes of... I put yokes of bonding, or rather, uh, yokes of bonding on you so that I can protect you. These yokes are good. They are for your pur they are for a purpose, and they are to keep you away from the devil. They are to keep you free from Satan's traps. These yokes and these bonds are set for a purpose to keep you safe and to keep you strong, and so that you don't have a tendency to go back into the things that you used to. That's powerful. He says, "Take my yoke." For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He said, I'm going to put some restriction on you while you give me your yoke. I'll take that big heavy thing that you're trying to carry around. I'll, I'll take all of that stuff that has weighed you down for all these years. And all I ask is that you take my yoke and take my burdens. My, mine are easy and they're light. Right. But they are meant for your protection and they are meant for your good. And they are meant so that you won't fall under the wiles of the devil. Right. It's powerful. Chapter 3, verse 1. But thou hast played the harlot with many lovers, yet return again unto me, says the Lord. You have played the harlot with many lovers. You've gone after different things in your life. You've chased after all these things in your life. And, and you've given your affections and you've given your time. You've given your time, your talent, your treasure to all these things. But the Lord is saying tonight, come back unto me. Forsake these idols and forsake these things and forsake the lifestyle of the harlot going after all kinds of things in life and forsake that stuff and come and return unto me. I'm so glad that he's willing to let us return unto him. I'm glad that he didn't just throw the book away on Terry and throw away the key and that he didn't write me off when I first messed up and even during my, all of my sins and, and during all of my troubles and during all of my tribulations, he has still stuck by me and said, return unto me. 
He, he didn't throw me away. He, he's not finished with me yet. He's got great plans for me. And He's still calling and hearkening into my heart. Say, come, draw nigh unto me while I draw nigh unto you. Come unto me. Verse 12, return thou backsliding Israel. Say, or let's say, return thou backsliding Christian. Say it, the Lord and I will not cause my anger to fall upon you. For I am merciful, says the Lord. And I will not keep anger forever. Only acknowledge your iniquity. You got to be right. You got to just get honest with God, right? We got to acknowledge the iniquities that are within us. We got to acknowledge the faults that are within us. We got to get real within our own selves, look ourselves in the mirror, and say, God, let me see myself through your eyes. Not just that I can see that I'm a child of God, but let me see that which is in me that hinders me from being all the fullness of that child of God. What does hinder me from being your, your child? What, does hinder, what is hindering my life from being the fullness of what you've created to me to be? Acknowledge your iniquity. And that thou hast transgressed against the Lord. You've got to get honest. You've sinned against the Lord and the Lord your God only. And has scattered thy ways to the strangers under every green tree. You have not obeyed my voice. You've gone after all these strange things. And you've done all this stuff that I told you not to. But I'm so loving and I'm so gracious. And I'm going to say, you come back to me. Verse 4, O Israel, saith the Lord. Or chapter 4, verse 1. Return unto me. And if thou wilt put away thine abominations out of my sight... Then shalt thou not remove. Put away these abominations. Put away these things that so easily creep into our lives. And that we give the preeminence to. Things that we give the preeminence to then become an idol, right? Anything that we give more time to and our heart to and our focus on and our attention to will become an idol. And God is saying, cast away these abominations. Destroy them. Burn them. Create with a, a place for them and stash them away and never go back to them. Hide them. Destroy them and put them away from your sight. There is no true life giving fulfillment apart from Jesus Christ. Nothing in this life, nothing physical, nothing of the flesh will ever bring satisfaction. Nothing in this life is ever meant to be a satisfaction but Him. And I know that we have a first blood, at, first Adam blood coursing through our veins. I, I'm very aware of the Adamic blood, the first man Adam. His blood, his sinful blood is coursing through my veins. And I know that and I'm aware of that. But I'm so thankful, Pastor Lee. I'm, I'm so thankful and I, I'm so humble that I have the final Adam's blood washed all over me. That, yes. that his blood on top of me covers the blood inside of me. And I, I'm so thankful that his blood was shed that I could get a blood bath and wash myself and had no my sins were as crimson he has caused me to be washed white as snow right thank you Jesus Romans 519 for by one man's disobedience many were made sinners but also so by the obedience of one shall many be made right. righteous and right. I refuse <clears throat> I refuse to live with a first Adam thinking when I got a yes. second Adam covenant I refuse to stay back in Egypt and stay back in that garden where, where the man messed up when I got a covenant that I could be walking with God right. and walking in righteousness and walking in holiness. I refuse uh, to live with a first Adam thinking when I got a second Adam covenant. 1 Corinthians 15, 21 to 22. For since by man came death by man, came also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, but in Christ all shall be made alive. Yes. So we see with the prodigal son. He left his father's house and went and tried this other kind of lifestyle. But the Psalm 84 says, better is one day in your courts than a thousand elsewhere. So the prodigal son found out that it was better to have one day with daddy's house than a thousand days elsewhere. It was better to be in the house of my father for one day than it was to be with these pigs and eating their corn cobs for a thousand years. And so he came back. And Jesus made us a way for us to enter into our father's house. John 10, he says, I am the door. And no man can enter in except he come through the door. And if he tries to come up over the gates and above the walls, he's a thief and a robber and he has no place with me. So Jesus says, I am the door. I am the way. I am the life. I am the way in which you enter into the sheepfold. He says, I have come to give you life and that life more abundantly. And he says about the thief, the, or the, the thief has come not, not to kill, uh, but to kill, steal, and destroy. But in that verse, if you go back to Hermeneutics and you really read the beginning of, of this chapter and understand the subject of what he's talking about, it's not the devil that he's talking about. It's deceptive pastors and shepherds that have perverted the word of God and have messed things up. And they are there to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus and I have come to give you life and life more abundantly. 
We don't have time in this generation for pastors and shepherds that are going to come and talk and tickle our ears and say, it's all right, you're doing good. Don't you get this stuff right? It's, this sin, it, it's all right, you're covered by grace. So just, just go on. Once you believe once, uh, you're eternally saved. Once saved, always saved. Uh, but the Bible is very clear that there were folks in, in Revelation that had their names blotted out of the Lamb's Book of Life. There are folks that are stricken from that book because of a sinful lifestyle. And so what we got to do in this time of seasons, right? Spring is a season, right? Spring starts to come forth. Things start to come out. Things start to come back to life, right? We start to see green grass again. Man, I'm thankful for some green grass. I'm thankful for some flowers coming up, some crocuses and some hyacinths. And that's about all the flowers I know. And we're starting to see <laughs> tulips. There we go, tulips. And we're starting to see them budding, right? And the buds on the trees. So we start to see new life coming again after a cold, dead winter, after a cold, a very cold winter. And so sometimes in our Christian walk, in our lives with God, we enter into that winter season where nothing seems alive and nothing seems to come forward and nothing really seems to be very fruitful. But God, in His sovereign grace and in His majesty, has given us a season in which we can celebrate a resurrection and some. If we're in here tonight and we found ourselves still in our walk with God in a cold, dead, dry winter, where no fruit is, where no life is, where nothing seems to be happening, we can enter into a place of spring in which things start to come forth and strings start to be budding and fruit starts to come out again. He's calling us to a resurrection. First Timothy 3.16, without controversy, Great is the mystery of godliness. It's a great mystery, but it's not a mystery hidden before all eyes. It is revealed in the following verses. God was manifest in flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. That sounds like my Jesus to me. It sounds like my Jesus was received up into glory, was seen of the angels, preached on by the Gentiles, and was justified in the spirit, manifest in flesh. And because of that, it was, he, it was brought to pass the saying, O oh, death, where is your sting? Where is your sting? And grave, where is your victory? For the sting of death is sin, strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through Jesus Christ. And by ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. For as much as you know your labor is not in vain. This thing is not in vain. This labor that we're doing, this fight that we're on. I talked about a couple weeks ago. I don't know what it was. What about the fight? And I talked about the fight. And how we have the violent of the kingdom of heaven suffer the violence and the violent take it by force. And so our labor, when we're laboring to stay in the kingdom, when we're laboring to fight against these enticements and these temptations that come our way, when we labor and fight and resist these things, the Bible says abstain from all appearances of evil. We'll resist the devil and he will flee. Take authority over these things. Uh, Romans 20, 16 says that he will cause Satan to be trodden under our foot. The God of all peace will cause Satan to be trodden under our foot. When we labor for him and labor in, in, a, in a way to try to stay right with God. It is not in vain. Hebrews 2.14 that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death that is the devil. First John 3.8 for this reason was the Son of God manifest that he might destroy the works of the devil. Beloved, let us cease from looking for fulfillment, joy, peace, and satisfaction in dead things. But look unto him who is the author and finisher of our faith. Let us die let us die tonight for he who loses his life shall keep it unto life eternal he that believeth in me though he were dead Jesus said yet shall he live and so he's calling us today as we come up and, and prepare ourselves for communion as we prepare ourselves for that time of fellowship with God as we prepare ourselves and our bodies and our minds and our spirits to receive of this thing let us be mindful and let us look back uh, at this past few seasons past few years past few little bit of time perhaps and then maybe we were in that dry season maybe we were in that winter time maybe we were in that place where it didn't seem like we had a closeness with God where we didn't have the fellowship that we once had with him or that we what we desire from him and God is saying behold I make all things new he can re resurrect not just our, our beings tonight. He can resurrect our spirits, resurrect our faith, resurrect our countenance, resurrect our hope, resurrect our peace, joy, and our happiness and our uh, joy unspeakable. He has the ability to resurrect that tonight. So as we're mindful and we think back of the cross and all that it cost him to purchase us, the precious price, which was the blood of Jesus, we look back and we remember the resurrection 
I'm getting up out the grave. And I'm so glad that he got up out and that he didn't just stay in the ground, right? But he got up for me. He got up so that I could walk again. He got up so that I could live again. He got up so that I could be ascended up in there where, where he is someday. And I'm so thankful and I'm so glad that I have that to look forward to. But during that time frame, during, from that time until now, and from now until then, I know that I gotta live. I gotta live a resurrected life. Romans 6, 6, and we're gonna, I'm going to close here. In Romans 6, it talks about baptism. Know ye not that as many of you that were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. And so also that you were baptized into his death, you shall also, uh, in the likewise of his resurrection, be brought into newness of life. And that's what we see happening right now in our, in our, in our environment, a newness of life, life springing forth, coming back. That even though winter came and and gave us a few sucker punches, right? And, and knocked some buds off and killed some flowers. Doesn't God always have a way to bring us back, even from a dead state, to, to bring life back into our bodies and breathe life back into our spirits so that we don't have to go after dead things or stay in a dead place or stay in a sepulcher or stay in the ground or stay in our, in our lowly state of countenance and, and a depression and an oppression. He causes us to have a resurrection life, a resurrected life. We remembered all that he did for us, all that it cost him. I talked last week about him humbling himself and taking on the form and fashion of a man. Let us tonight humble ourselves before him. And if we got some stuff in our lives that aren't right, if we're playing the harlot as Israel did, if, if we're chasing after all these other things and sources of satisfaction, let us tonight be honest with God and humble ourselves. He says, acknowledge your iniquity and admit that you've trespassed against me. Tonight, let us take our sins before him, lay them down upon the cross and put ourselves up there and say, Lord, whatever you got to do, whatever you got to purge, whatever you got to take from me, whatever you got to cause me to relinquish out of my life, take it from me tonight, Lord. Resurrect Resurrect my hope, my faith, and my love. Give me joy unspeakable, faith unshakable, and love unstoppable tonight. For with God, nothing is impossible. So if you're in need of a resurrection tonight, I can assure you His Spirit's here to do it. If we just get honest with Him, seek Him with an honest heart. He can restore that which we've lost and revive that which we desire. Let God have His way tonight. Let Him have His way. Yes, Lord. Pray to God. We lift my world. Take the throne of my heart, oh God. We lift my love. Be lifted. special night it's a night where we examine ourselves um, in the faith and this, this is a celebration of what Christ did for us like Pastor Terry said why seek you the living among why seek you the dead among the living we're here to celebrate see when the Catholic Church they celebrate mass and communion consistently and they crucify Christ over and over and over again 
I'm here to celebrate the resurrection and the life. The life. The life that Christ gave for us. For His blood was shed for many for the remission of sins. For many, not all. For not all, not all have faith, we found out earlier. But I have faith to believe that Jesus Christ died and rose again. And I confess Him as my personal Savior. And that's the first step of the process. The step It's not over there. Pastor Terry brought up in Romans 6.6 6, that we are buried with Him in baptism. We are planted in the likeness of His death. I partake of repentance through His death. And I take partake of His death, burial, and resurrection through the water baptism in Jesus' name. And if you haven't had that experience to be baptized in Jesus' name, I highly recommend that you go down and I don't highly recommend, I command you in the name of the Lord to go down in the water in the name of Jesus to find remission of sins. For his, when, the, when the Roman soldier took a spear, he took that key, that, 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 that door, Christ was the door, and that door went up a hill called Calvary. And they took that door and they nailed him on a cross. And, and a Roman soldier took a spear. He took that key and put it inside of the door. And he turned it. And when he did, that door opened up the salvation of the church of the living God. Because when the Roman soldier took a door, the spear, blood and water flowed out. Blood and water flowed out. And that life is in the blood. The children of Israel forbidden it to drink the blood off of their food because life was in the blood and that life is in the blood that Christ shed for us but also that flowed out of that wound in the side was water the blood and the water flow together brother Terry I believe that the blood and the water flow together I believe I gained the blood of Christ through the waters of baptism and I'm also resurrected to the newness of life Colossians 2 and 9 for in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in Him who is the head of all principality and power. Bur buried with Him. Being circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. And you being dead in your sins and trespasses have He quickened together. Having forgiven you all trespasses. Buried with Him in baptism. Therefore we are risen with Him through the faith of the operation of God who raised Him from the dead. God gave me a remedy. And that's what I'm here to say today. God gave me a remedy. And that remedy is Christ. I preach Christ crucified to the Jews of stumbling block. Spirit, water, and blood. These three agree in one. They agree in one. And we're here to celebrate what He did for us. Sister Hannah, would you hand out our... Uh, our uh, would you hand to each one uh, a cup and our uh, bread? Just a real quick explanation, and, and this isn't going to take long. We observe Passover, or we observe the, um, the Lord's death, burial, and resurrection. We observe that once a year. Um, that's just a personal belief based upon the Passover. Shortly before Christ's death, he observed the Passover and uh, with his disciples, and they partook of the what's called the Last Supper. And this is when he observed that. And that was right around the Passover time. Do we nail it on the day? Not always. Sometimes you just can't. Uh, I'm observing it on, on what the world calls Good Friday um, at the boot camp. But that is why we kind of observe it once a year. Some churches do a little differently. But it's a very important night. It's a night, like Pastor Terry's talked about in, in his message, that we need to examine ourselves in, in, in a sense that maybe things that are amiss. We've got to understand that God is merciful and loving towards us all. We all have faults. We all have failures. We all have weaknesses. We all have shortcomings. Each one of us. And tonight's a night where we examine those. And uh, 
that we examine ourselves and that we pray. And we pray that Christ forgives us of anything we've done wrong. He's so merciful, He's so wonderful, and He's so loving. We pray that we not only can confess or, or confess our sin, but forsake that sin. And yeah, we're all going to need one of those. And I'm going to read you a portion of Scripture. And it comes out of the book of Corinthians. It's a very important night. We don't take this night lightly. Um, in Catholicism, they believe that this turns into the actual body and this turns into the actual blood of Christ. Once again, crucifying Him over and over and over again. I celebrate life. But we do observe the death. And this is a memorial for what Christ did for us. Now in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, the Apostle Paul, as he covers the Lord's Supper and then commemorating, and in verse 18 it says, For first of all, when you come together in the church, I hear that there be divisions among you, and I partly believe it. For there must be also heresies among you, that which are among you may be manifest among you. When you come together, therefore, into one place, this is not to eat the Lord's Supper. They must have been doing it every single service. I don't know what was going on, but that's the preeminent view I have on what, what that says. For in eating, everyone taketh before one other his own supper, and one is hungry and another is drunken. Um, the reason we use grape juice in here, 100% grape juice, non-fermented, um, there might be people struggling with addiction. There might be people who struggle with alcohol. And so, and of course, I'm going to do that to boot camp because there's a lot of addictions out there. Um, and that's, that's my take on that. And I know my father, he struggled with alcohol. He was an alcoholic clear in about 1970-something, late 70s, and he had hands delivered on him in the name of Jesus, and he never touched it again. He could, he could not touch it again. So there's some reasons why we do that. Um, for in eating, everyone taketh before his own, his supper, and one is hungry and another is drunk, and they were, they were abusing the very memorial that we take and hold so dearly. What do you have ye not houses to eat or drink in, verse 22, or despise ye the church of God, and shame them that have not? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you in this? I praise you not. For I have received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the, Lord, that the same night, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And after the same manner also he took the cup which he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you eat as oft as you drink it in the remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this, and this is serious, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord, or in an unworthy manner. But let a man examine himself, so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he eateth and drinketh unworthily, he eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep or are dead. For if we should judge ourselves, we should not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened to the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Wherefore, my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry one for and wait for one another. And if any man hunger, let him eat at home. And let... And ye come not together into condemnation. The rest will I set in order when I come. Now, none of us are perfect. We know that. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. We all fall under the shame of sin. We all fall under the condemnation of sin through Adam. The Bible says in Adam, we all die. But in Christ, all shall be made alive. Well, thank God for what he did. Thank God for what he did. I have hope. Thank God I, I have power to confess and forsake the things that I struggle with. And it, we all do. Every one of us sin. If any man say he sins not, he's a liar. And had not God in him. If we say we don't sin, we're lying. I, every one of us. We all fail. We've all fallen short. Each one of us. Myself included. We all have things that we struggle with. But we're going to pray to the Lord God of heaven and earth. We're going to offer up this sacrifice of prayer unto God prior to taking communion. And then we'll wrap the service up with taking communion. But uh, we want to confess things in our heart and in our mind. And this is our opportunity to do that right now. Father of heaven and earth, each and every one of us fallen short, each one, Lord, I pray. I ask you to pray yourself in your own moment. I ask you to pray right now. God, I pray. We're, we're, we're needy people. We need, we need you, Lord. We need you, Jesus. We need your strength in this life. We, we need your help in this life. We know that there are weaknesses within all of us, Lord. We all know we need you, Jesus. 
God, if there are shortcomings in me, I ask you that you look upon them with grace and mercy and loving kindness. Each one of us, help us to forsake those elements that, that have tried to destroy us, oh God. Help us to forsake those elements that, that have wrought us in bondage, Lord. Help us to forsake the waters of Egypt, as Pastor Terry talked about in Sihon. And, and, and these things that have brought us into subjection to the Satan. God, I pray in the name of Jesus, I curse everything within my heart that is against your kingdom. Everything that exalts itself above the throne of God, Lord, I pray in the name of Jesus, bring into subjection. Lord, forgive me. Forgive me, Lord. I speak for myself and myself only. Lord, if I've sinned against you knowingly or unknowingly, Lord, Lord, I need help from you. And Lord, we thank you. We thank you. In Jesus' lovely name. Can you say in Jesus' name, people? Amen. All right. At this time, take your... Um, this represents our unloved cracker here. This represents the body of Christ. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. Jesus, Jesus. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for what you did. Price we couldn't pay, oh God. And after the same manner also he took the cup. And when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament. In my blood, this do ye as oft as you drink it in remembrance of me. Take and drink. Thank you, God. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did. This Oh, I've got chills up my spine right now when I think about what he did. A price that I can never pay. My life be lifted high in my world. Be lifted my love. Be lifted. this great night, this great message. Why seek ye the living among the dead? We thank you, Jesus. We celebrate your life. We celebrate it tonight. We're not having service next week. We thank you for what you did, Lord God. We thank you for rising again on the third day, paying a price that I could never pay. It was me, Lord, that probably would have nailed you there. Unfortunately, I hate to say that, but I would have been there. But you paid it all. Father, forgive them. For they know not what they do. We thank you in Jesus' name. Jesus, we, we all say in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Amen. Be blessed. Amen.